good to see you tonight. I'm glad you're here. And um, if you come to hear me the first time, that's curiosity. If you come back a second time, there's hope. And so <laughs> I'm sure glad you're here tonight. And thank the Lord for it. Well, let's take our Bible and let's turn to the book of Revelation. I said this morning that I wanted to bring a lesson on evaluating our homes. And I can't evaluate yours, I can evaluate mine, but I don't live in your home. And uh, what it is, is a set of about seven questions that I have to ask you and some remarks made around it. But I wanna give you something that is a lesson, I'm not gonna teach it, but I wanna give you four things to consider. And uh, <clears throat> I dug this up somewhere, so I'm not gonna claim it. But if you wanna give me the credit, I'll take it. Uh, and it's based on Psalm 127 and Psalm 128 verses 1 through 4 if you want a, a reference to that. We're not going to read it. This is just something I want to give you. And uh, it, the title of it was Family Formulas. It's so good and I just want to give them. I'm not going to develop this at all. But I want to give you four things that are family, family formulas. Number one, God is the builder, not humans. God is the builder, not humans. We think we're doing it. No, we, we're just in the hands of God. He, he builds through us in his word. Number two, children are rewards, not punishment. Children are rewards, not punishment. You'd be amazed in my counseling office through the years, things I've heard. And uh, children deserve the best in parenting and uh, takes discipline on your part to be that. I know they can drive you batty sometimes, but you know, bats hang around, so just stay where you're at. Number three, mates are cultivators, not exterminators. Mates are cultivators, not exterminators. Number four, children grow from attention, not suffer from neglect. Now you'll find all that in Psalm 127, Psalm 128, verses one through four. And you can read that and study it and figure out what's what. But those are four good little points I want to give to you. Home evaluation. In the book of Revelation, it opens, and of course it's a book of prophecy, we understand that. We're not gonna get into the prophecy side of it or the prophetical side of it. We're going to get into the opening of it because the opening of it is not necessarily prophetical. It's an introduction. But the first thing that we are introduced to are the seven churches of Asian Minor. They're all different. And yet Jesus, in his valuation of these seven churches, says one thing, the same thing, to all seven churches. I want us to look at chapter 3, if you would, please. And we're just going to read two and a half verses. So let's look at chapter three of Revelation and let's read verse one and part of verse two. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Yeah. Now don't read that quickly. And don't read that in a hurry to get to another point. Stop and consider what you've read. Yeah. It's a terrible thing to be dead and not know it. Right. But hey, he says that's what this church is. Right. We're talking about relationship now. We're taking it away from the local New Testament church, which these churches were. And let's take it and put it into that which God has made as a first institution, and that's the home and the family. And let's see some things that he said to this church, and then we want to take out of that and produce six or seven questions for us to consider tonight on the evaluation of our home and our relationships. Let's pray. Would you, Father, we come to you tonight, thank for each one that is here. Bless them, encourage them, help them, we pray. Enable me, I ask in Jesus' name, to be what I need to be for these people's sake, for the sake of homes and marriages and families 
And Lord, I would praise you forever and will praise you forever for any ability that you give me to do what is called on me to do tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Make sure you're here tomorrow night, Tuesday night, because we're going to dig into Ephesians chapter 5. Now let me give you a little bit of a preview. I'm going to give you three things starting tomorrow night. I'm going to talk about the four major causes of divorce. Then I'm going to talk about problem solving in a relationship. And then we're going to dig into the Word of God. And we're going to talk on biblical ingredients for a godly marriage. And uh, believe it or not, that's actually what I wrote my thesis on for my doctorate. And uh, I never did publish it, but I did use that. And so look for those things and bring others with you. It'll help you and it'll encourage you. Loaded and loaded and loaded with information. Now let's go back into chapter 3 of Revelation. And there's, there's two things that I want to draw out for our attention as we get ready to pose these questions to us. First of all, I want you to look, if you would please, in verse 2. He says, be watchful. Be watchful. Now, it doesn't take a lot of intelligence to understand what it means to be watchful. It means to be aware, to watch, evaluate, plan, keep awake, is what he's saying. And so be watchful about these things. Uh, have, how many of you, and I'm, I'm a country kid, and how many of you know what a kill deer is? Now, I didn't ask you to you know what it is to kill a deer. And, uh, but how many of you know what a kill deer is? Anyone? All right. It's a bird. And uh, they, they're an interesting bird. Uh, they're a tractor bird, but they got a, they got a weird sound. And, uh, but they lay, the hen lays her eggs in rocks. And uh, if you, I challenge you, there was one built a nest in my son's driveway and I was, had a nephew and his son uh, with me the other day and we were walking back and I knew where that nest was right in the general area. She had five eggs in it. And uh, I stopped just short of that nest and uh, the boy's name is uh, Isaiah. And I said, Isaiah, there's a, nurse, there's a bird's nest within three feet of you. Uh, you find it and tell me where it's at. And he didn't look in the gravel. He looked up in the grass around on each side of the driveway and he's walking here and there and one thing. And he finally said, Walker Roger, I can't see it. I said, uh, a, a bird's nest. I said, yeah, it, it's, it's right within view. You're standing within just a couple feet of it. And my, then my nephew, that was his son, my grandnephew, and my, but my, my nephew uh, said, Uncle Roger said, where in the world do you see a bird's nest? And I just walked up to it and I bent down and I pointed my finger and uh, they said, I've never seen anything like that. I said, did, you didn't see it before, you couldn't find it. And, uh, but they look just like rocks. The eggs look just like rocks and you can't see them. But in a distance was the old hen, and she threw a fit. They act like they're injured. When you find get close to their nest, they act like they're injured, and they'll lay down on their side, and they'll flop their wings and kick their uh, legs, and they, they just have a weird sound. They're just an a odd thing. But she's watchful. She's watchful. She is aware of, and she bewares of what is going on around her. She keeps awake. My dear friend, we allow invasion into our home and our relationships because we are not watchful. And um, I've had people through the years in my counseling office say, I don't know where this came from. I don't know where my children learned this. I, I wasn't raised this way. You know why your children are that way? Because you're not raising them the way you were raised. I have a relative very, very close to me who said, when I grow up and have a family, I'm not going to raise mine like I was raised. And she kept her word. And as a result of it, her children are everywhere. They wander everywhere. They live strange lives. Listen to me. We need to return to the old way and to the old paths right. because they have been tried, proven, and tested. They still stand the test of time. And... Uh, you know, there's something about God's standard that never changes. Now, I understand being innovative and things of that nature, 
but don't change truth to where it ceases to be truth. Truth is truth. And then notice he uses another word here, not only be watchful, but he says strengthen the things that remain. Strengthen the things that remain. Now, that gives us hope. Class, listen to me tonight. I don't know what's in your family. I don't know what's in your home. I don't know what's going on in your marriage. And some of you here tonight may really be almost to the end of everything. I don't know that, but there's a possibility. And I haven't talked to a preacher, don't want to. That way I can talk freely and trust the Holy Spirit for me to say something uh, without offending you because I love you, I care for you, I'm not mad at you. I don't have rocks, rocks to throw at you and whips to snap at you. I just want to present truth to all of you. And listen, the worst that you can be is never beyond the reach of God's ability to retrieve. You, you have me on that? I have seen God do unbelievable things. And all of it is on people that say, all right, I've tried it my way and it has worked. I'm going to do it God's way. And God has allowed his truth to be manifested to bring a revival into something that was under the judgment of God's word. Now, let's look at something. I have a number of questions I want to ask you. And let's go into these questions with uh, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. And talk, when you talk about strength and fortify, build up. Be resolute about the, be, the need. Now, question number one. This is for both husband and wife. All these questions I want the husband to write down, I want the wives to write down, and then I want you to answer it to the best of your ability. And if you can't answer tonight, take it home and answer it later. But be honest with yourself, all right? Number one, are you honest in wanting to do your part in making your home the best it can be? Now let me ask the question. Are you honest in wanting to do your part in making your home the best it can be? Now why do I ask that question? Here's the reason I ask that question. is because in many, many relationships, it is the effort of one that's trying to do the job of two. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. See, we have five sons. They're all grown men now. And uh, I mean, our baby is what, 43, right around that? And uh, our oldest son is 53, right in that area. And uh, listen to me. I have interest in those boys. I just not, did not father them, but I parented them. And there's a difference. There's a lot of people that can be fathers, but very few that are dads. And they relinquish their responsibility to where they overload the wife to be both husband and wife, both mom and dad. It doesn't work. I can take you all over Middletown, Ohio, and my wife can attest to this because she's experienced the same thing. Knock on doors in that city, and here's invariably what you'll hear over and over and over and over and over and over again. Oh, Grace Baptist Church, yes, I know about Grace Baptist Church. My mother took me there when I was little. Rarely do you ever hear, oh yeah, my dad took me there. My mother took me there, or my grandmother took me there. We are lacking the male leadership that God has ordained to lead the home and the family. So are you honest? in wanting to do your part in making your home the best it can be. Number two, what issues are you having in your family with your spouse, with your children, etc.? There could be myriads of things. What issues are you having in your family? Now, out of that question, out of that question, Someone goes, well, I don't really know that we have any issues. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, is there blood run through your veins? Are you a human being? Are you a man? Are you a woman? Don't give me that. Don't tell me, oh, I don't think there's any issues. Listen to me. 
as surely as God has ordained men and women are to be one in a relationship, I've got news for you. A woman is a woman and a man is a man. Amen. God made us that way. There's balance in that. Do you understand that? And in our differences, oftentimes, are created issues. But there is not necessarily two rights. Somewhere, something is going to take balance off of something, and it's going to cause it not to be just in the relationship. We're not talking about fairness. Do you know God does not work on the realm of fair? God works on the realm of just. We are to live on that same standard of justice. What is right? For instance, one of the things my wife and I determined when we finally had children, we were married for three years before we ever had a child. And um, then we had space between number one and number two. Then we had more space between two and three. But then when something unlocked and three, four, and five just, just <laughs> really came along. And, uh, but we made this policy, we made this policy, this agreement in our lives that we would always defend each other in rules, regulations, and discipline in our home. Never. Never would we allow a child to say this, uh, I tell them no, so they go to mom, so she'll say yes. That wasn't a good day in their life. That's right. <laughs> you, you know, they, they learn this. What one says, both are in agreement. I remember one of our sons had a buddy from up, up the street. We were living in Sandusky at that time. And uh, I was sitting in the family room, and they were in the living room, and they wanted to do something. I don't know what it was, and they had gone to their mother, or my son had gone to the mother to ask permission. I don't know what it was, have no idea, no memory of it, except the incident. And she told them, no, you can't go, no, you can't go. And I knew she had told them I, no. I had heard her deny them. And so they're back in the living room. And uh, this neighbor boy, friend to my son, I heard him say, go ask your dad. And I heard my son say this, oh no, you don't want to do that. But there are issues in our life because Satan's going to see to it that there are differences in likenesses. And if they are not understood and known, that which was a speck becomes a beam. Now, communication, we're going to touch on this tomorrow night, but communication is the key to problem solving in a relationship. You must understand one another. You must talk to one another. You can't play the ostrich syndrome. Bury your head and when I pull it out, it's all going to be gone. No, it'll be worse. There must be communication or, or this. Men, you're not going to like this. But how many times has one of your children ever come to you and, and you say this? Go ask your mother. Wait a minute, <coughs> let's see. I work, I get a paycheck. <coughs> it helps pay for the electricity. It pays for water and trash. It puts food on the table. Oh, wait a minute. <coughs> I might have a voice in this. See, my boys always knew my opinion. I'm the dad. I can hurt them. I can make them very unhappy. I can make them rue the day they did that. Why? I'm the father. She and I are one in the discipline, in the direction, in the teaching, in the philosophy, in the guidelines of our relationship. That's called keeping peace in the family. 
And I love peace better than I love war. Oh, I have ammunition. And every once in a while, as Dr. Jack Howe said many, many, many years ago, don't use an A-bomb when a firecracker will work. We go to the extreme of things. So what are the issues that you may be having in your family, with your spouse, your children, etc.? Know them, understand them, and even say this. Well, you know, maybe, maybe the reason this is going this way, it may be because of this over here, and I never gave that thought. You have to be honest with yourself. Then number three, how much of these issues can be contributed to you? Oh, this is a good point. This is like jelly on a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Listen to me. Here's the question. How much of these issues can be contributed to you? Now, let's stop and let me tell you a little story. I've got worlds of stories. In my pastor, I said, believe it or not, with this accent, I pastored in Kalamazoo, Michigan for a number of years. <coughs> they used to advertise, come here, preacher, talk. That, that was their gimmick. They'd never heard anybody talk to me like me, but I never heard anybody talk like you either. And so it was kind of a two-way street. And um, so uh, I'm trying to think what my story was now. Uh, oh, I got it. Small church, growing church, but God moved me. And uh, for the first time, I was an assistant pastor. Everything stopped at the pastor's desk and didn't infiltrate into my study. And then I passed church Kalamazoo, and God blessed there, and the church grew, and I had a secretary, and then I finally got a, a youth director, music man. So that was great. And so then I took a troubled church up in Sandusky, Ohio, and battled that for 11 years, and God gave us a phenomenal victory there, and that's, that's another story. But then God moved me to Grace Baptist Church in Middleton, Ohio, and I liken it to this way. When I was in Sandusky, I was a one-man band, but when I took the church at Grace Baptist Church, I became the director of an orchestra. I had nearly 100 employees at that church. I was finally able to reduce it down to 85. But, listen, it overwhelmed me. It overwhelmed me. And I'd had Bible college and things of that nature, and I'd earned my degrees and things of that nature, but I was never taught practical pastoring. And so I knew that I had men on my staff, I had women secretaries, I had receptionists, I had uh, school teachers in our Christian school that was quite large, and I just had on and on and on. And the buck did stop. So I was trying to figure out one day, God, I, I need help. I really don't know how to handle this thing. You know, it's one thing to get on a horse and hold reins, but it's another thing to get on a stagecoach and be responsible for um, six horses. You know, that, that's different. So I got to thinking, and finally I found a course on supervision. On supervision. So I, I paid for it, and I took it for non-credit, and it was a secular course, had nothing to do with God, Bible, Jesus, all I had to do was just how to try to handle people. It was great. It was a great, great course. Matter of fact, I still have it. And as I sat and I listened to this course, he finally came to problem solving in the workplace. And by that time, I got to realize, I wonder if this guy is a Christian. Man, he, he just knows so many principles that... He, they're biblical, but he's not saying they're biblical. Of course, it's in a secular setting. And so uh, he came to problem solving in a relationship. And this is going to be revisited Monday night. He said, in problem solving, ask yourself this question. 
How much of the problem is your fault? And then he followed it up by saying this. If you're honest with yourself, you may have solved the problem. Isn't that good? That's good. Because that's not only applicable in the workplace, that's applicable in a marriage. That's applicable in the home. Because there's many, many, many times, and I don't want to put too many's on there, but there's many times I'm the problem. But it's easy to say, she made me do that. By the way, that is biblical accusation. All you have to do is go and find Adam. Well, it's this woman you gave me. How much can be contributed to you in how you lead or how you don't lead? Be honest with yourself. And in that honesty, find yourself saying, I will man up, even if you're a woman. I will woman up, and I will go to my spouse and ask forgiveness and apologize for what I have done wrong to cause this issue in our home and our marriage. That takes a big person. That takes maturity. Instead of accusing when in truth, I'm the problem. Number four, don't miss this one. Are you a shepherd or a dictator? Are you a shepherd or a dictator? Let me tell you the difference. Shepherds lead. Dictators drive. In my counseling office, do you know where these questions have come from? There. Because it's these things I have to deal with so many, many, many times. And so many men misunderstand Ephesians 5 when it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto the husband." As, and here's what they don't know about that verse, as unto the Lord. Colossians says, as in the Lord. Ladies, you're never to be submissive to wrong. You're never to be submissive to sin. You're never to follow which is contrary to the will of God or the word of God. Submission and leadership is due to right leadership that honors Christ. And you won't believe some of the things that I've had in my counseling office through the years of what men expect of their wives. They are dictators instead of shepherds. Can I tell you something? I was raised on a farm. And my father raised sheep for many, many, many years. And if a shepherd is a proper shepherd, his sheep automatically loves him. And the sheep trust him. But if you're a dictator, you become abusive. And the relationship becomes about you instead of about your home. This isn't about me. It's about her in me. It's about the leadership that I give to my children. See, I want them to be a success. Teachers teach. Shepherds teach. Now wait a minute. Dictators teach. Have you ever heard someone say something like this? She's just like her mother. He's just like his dad. That's the way his dad was. I had a funeral a number of years ago. True. I had a funeral a number of years ago. And evidently, I didn't know the old gentleman that that died. Somebody in the community that didn't have a pastor and the funeral home called me and I I had the funeral. The old gentleman died and they had him laid out in the funeral home and there was a number of children And they were all standing in front of their dad. And I heard one of the children say, he's finally dead. 
And another responded and said, we're happy. He was mean. He was unkind. Another one spoke up and said, he'll never beat me again. Can you imagine? Thrilled their daddy had died. Now listen to this again. Are you a shepherd or a dictator? Now I'm going to hang an addendum on that. Parents make a mistake. And somewhere we think that this is grown up. We tell children, no, you can't go there. No, you can't do that. And a child very innocently can say, well, why not? And if the child is really misfortunate, the parent will just rear back and backhand them. And they'll say something like this, the parent, you do it because I say so. Write this one down. Rules without reason breed contempt. Rules without reason breeds contempt. Brother David said something to this effect in Sunday school this morning about God never says no without saying why. That's true. Study his book. There's a lot of no's in the Word of God. There's a lot of yeses in the Word of God. But God never, ever says no that He does not give the reason why. I may not like the reason, but I know it. And a child can be innocent and say, well, I don't understand that rule. Why are you telling me I cannot do or I cannot go or give me a reason? It's more than just because I say so. Have a reason. At least. They may not like the reason, but they know the reason. Rules without reason breeds contempt. Number five. What can you do to change the issues in your home? What can you do? See, I can't change my sweetheart over here, not that I want to. But just say we really are at odds and we're locking horns. And I cannot change her. But I can change me. I cannot make others do what's right. But I can do what I know is right. That I can do. What I'm getting ready to give you on Monday and Tuesday nights. If I heard this once. I couldn't tell you how many times I've heard it through the many years of counseling. If I knew these principles, I probably would not marry the man that I'm married to. Or if I knew these biblical principles and we applied and living, we wouldn't be in this office needing help now. Right. Or I always started pre uh, marital uh, counseling out this way. When were you married? They tell me. Who married you? They'll tell me. And then I'd say this. And how much premarital counseling did you receive? Most of the time, none. And if I were to take a survey in this room tonight and looking at older people, which we are, and I'm not going to ask them, but probably most Older people in this room received no counsel before they got married. I would not marry people without counseling them. Because I stand before God accountable for the people that I unite in marriage. Right. And if they will not sit in my presence for premarital counseling, I will not perform the ceremony. Amen. Just a few months ago, I had, I had a good one. Listen to this one. Man and woman have been married for 38 years. 38 years. And they got a divorce. 38 years. And he left her. And um, he left her for eight months. And he couldn't live without her. 
So he went back home. They never got married. They lived together for several years. And one of their sons just shamed them into it. And uh, so they came. Somebody recommended for them to come to me. They came to me, and they wanted to get married. Said, you know, we, we really do love one another. And uh, so I asked, I asked him, I said, well, that's wonderful that you love one another. I said, but I must ask you this question. Why did you get a divorce? He said, well, we've been married 38 years. Said, for some reason, she got the idea that I had money. And she began to spend it, and we didn't have it. And said, so I kept going after her, kept going after her, kept going after her. And she went, do it. Says, I had enough. And I said, I quit. I said, all right. And by the way, money is the number one issue of divorce. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow night. But I said, well, okay, let me ask this. Have you corrected the problem? If you have not corrected the problem, it's done. I won't go any further. And she spoke up. She said, oh, has he corrected the problem? I said, and who was the problem? And he goes, and she said, I was. Said, I was the problem. And said, I've asked him to forgive me. I've asked God to forgive me. And I've asked God to forgive me for causing the issue that brought us to a divorce. And we want to be remarried. And so I married them with all their kids and grandkids standing around under a tent out in a pouring rain in freezing weather. <laughs> but if you do not correct what's wrong here, it will not improve here. I said that basically this morning. But what can you do to change the issues in your home? Number six, what are you willing to do to help change your family home life with your spouse, your children, and the issues? What are you willing to do? Now, with that question asked, I refer back to a comment on number three. How much of the problem is your fault? It's an honest question. What are you willing to do? It's not, well, she changes, or if he changes, then maybe there's hope. No, there's probably a good deal that there needs to be change in both. Because here's what happens. Now, see how accurate I am. You live in a lopsided marriage. And part of that marriage is really given to one of the spouses. Honestly, it's a fact. They're wrong. They've been wrong. They are the issue within the relationship. It's what's bringing it to a demise. And because of that action, it has affected your life negatively. And in order for this person to be right, you've got to be right. And you cannot take that attitude of defense into a refreshed relationship without the consequences of indifference. Can't do it. You need to be changed as much as the person that caused the change. Make sense? Okay. Number seven. Don't miss this. It's my last question. And I, when I ask it, I want to look at your faces. Are you ready? How do you believe your spouse would answer these questions? About you. What would their attitude be? What would their answer be? Some of you already have it rolled around in your head, so I don't want to know, <laughs> or I do know. It would not be anything but a hot time in the old town tonight. I don't believe I would in dancing, but I think I'd be doing some. Now, these questions can only be answered when you and I follow biblical directions with honesty about ourselves. 
Do you know, and I believe this with all my heart, this sweet lady has been with me for almost 55 years. Literally, we have been a couple as far as boyfriend and girlfriend back over 55 years, almost 56 years. And we dated. That's one thing we did in my era. We dated. And uh, no one on earth, no one on earth, not my children, my mother and daddy are dead, long time, but they did not know me like she knows me. She knows me. I mean, she knows me so well, we don't even talk. We just answer each other. It's amazing. But now let's back at Revelation chapter 3. I know thy works. Let's break it down to the individual. Jesus talked about the institution of the church. I know thy works. He knows Temple Baptist Church. He knows the heart of this work. He knows the intent of its works. There's no secrets with God. He knows what goes on behind the barn. It's a country analogy. Only Ron knows that one. Let me tell you, I'm the youngest of eight children. I have five sisters and two brothers, my senior. There's only four of us living now. Four of us have graduated on into heaven. I have a brother next to me that he and his wife died within 10 days of each other in November with COVID. And uh, I miss him. Didn't see each other very much, but I miss him. And um, I know thy works. My dad, he was a kind gentleman, but he was a determined individual, and he led the family. He loved us children, but he was a disciplinarian. Had to be with eight kids. Now, children, shut your ears. There's an activity that boys do on the farm. And it has to do with cornfields and corn silk and brown paper bags. Some of you know where I'm going. In the fall of the year, the corn silk would be drying up and my brother and I would go down and We'd get us a bunch of corn silk and sneak a brown paper bag out of the house and we'd roll us one. We'd get behind the barn and light that thing up. It would strip varnish off of a banister rail. We would inhale that stuff. It would strip our throats raw. And we would say something like this. It was so intelligent. We would say, <laughs> Man, that was good. <laughs> I remember one evening, my brother and I, we were, we were imbibing in this. And one of my sisters, or maybe even my mother, came onto the back stoop of that old farmhouse and hollered, Supper's on! Come get ready. So we threw it in the manure and stomped on it and made sure it stayed under the ground. And we're waving it all and opening our mouth and running so no smell would be on us when we got to the house. <laughs> we went in the house, washed our hands, sat down, and we had, a, we had assigned places at the supper table. My daddy was always at the head. And to his right, my mother sat in the second seat. I had a seat, kind of a stool on the corner. And my brother sat on this corner. And the rest of the children, my grandfather, sat at the far end. And my dad came to the table and he stood up before anything was served. And he said... Uh, what have you boys been doing? I looked at him, he looked at me, and 
and it's kind of like stereo. We both responded, oh, nothing. And my da dad looked at me and he looked at my brother Stetson and he said, it doesn't smell like nothing. Be sure your sin will find you out. I know thy works. If God knows the works of a church, he knows the works of a marriage. He knows the heart of its leadership. He knows the work of our relationship. He knows our love of one another. He knows the investment of ourselves into each other. He knows our thoughts of one another. He knows. He knows the drive, the purpose behind every action. He knows. He knows the work of our parenting. He knows when I would get up in the middle of the night, cold winter time, and I walk around and check the, every one of my boys. I'd kneel and pray beside them. They didn't know it. God knew that. I had to succeed as a father. I could not fail my boys. I could not allow life to become me for me. I had to have life become me for them. God knew my works. God knew her works as a mother leading and directing and disciplining as well as I, our children. God knows. God knows you. God knows your home. God knows your relationship. A young girl came to see me one day. She was about 14 years of age. She was in our church and also in the Christian school. Her father happened to be one of my deacons. It was early morning, beginning of school. She had gotten an excuse to leave her class to come to see the pastor. She sat in my office and she began to weep. And she said, Pastor, I feel compelled to let you be advised of something. My home is not a good home. Said, I live in a very unhealthy place. I need help. She said, you think you know my mother and my father. But you have no idea who you're pastoring. Said my mother just keeps her mouth closed. But my father can't stand you. And said we have heard everything you could imagine. About what my father thinks of you. My pastor. She wept. Where are you leading your family? My boys are all grown. They have given us 19 grandchildren. It's wonderful. It blesses our heart to see them doing right things. But they didn't learn that from mistakes. They learned that from biblical principle. Now, I'm not building myself up. Please, I've done some of the stupidest things. I've had to take my children aside and beg their forgiveness for things that I just should not have done or said. My oldest son, I remember I took him out, and this was several years after the incident. I totally, I totally missed the boat in discipline in one area of his life. It, it, was, it was so wrong. 
And finally, I couldn't get beyond it. And I told him, I said, Tony, he was probably about 13 years of age, 14 years of age by this time. I told him, I said, I took him to Burger King. And I fed him. And I said, Tony, I always took my boys on their birthday, but this was not a birthday, so he knew something was different about it. And I said, Tony, I have brought you out just one-on-one -on -one to ask you to forgive me. And I was broken. And I told him of the incident. And that young teenage boy looked across the table and he said, Daddy, I don't even remember that. <laughs> but before I could be right with him, I had to be right with God. We need to be human with our family. I've given you seven questions Seven, God knows our works. When God is first in our lives and we on purpose make ourselves second to our family and then first in responsibility, God honors our life with His richest blessings. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way as you go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What is my training? Salvation, separation, service. But I cannot teach what I do not know. I cannot teach what I do not practice. I cannot give what I do not have. And we wonder how Satan invades our families. This is family and home. These days are dedicated to what I'm talking about. I told you this morning, these days are going to be different. There is not normal standard, some guy up here bellowing like a bull. It's me having a compassion for your home, your family, knowing what has sat in front of my counseling desk for these many, many, many years, but also knowing this, through God's help, biblical principles, God can bring a revival into broken families. And I believe this. We will never have revival here until we have revival in our home. It's not necessarily that the church affects the home. It is the church or the home that is to infect the church and I use the correct word when you get things discompobulated out of the standard of God's order it always goes wrong always here's an illustration that I want to give you I love mechanical clocks I have for years I love working on them, and uh, I have clocks all over my house. There's something banging, clanging, clinging, or cuckooing somewhere, everywhere around the house. I really enjoy piddling with them, and many times I find out I can fix them. It's like giving the soul back to a clock. Clocks are meant to run, and I go into people's homes, and they have they have beautiful clocks and they're just sitting there not doing what they're made for. I wish they'd just give me their clock. My wife doesn't, but I do. <laughs> when my mother died, I got all her non-working clocks. One of my sisters took the others. I got none non-working clocks. Out of the non-working clocks, only one is not working. And I figured out what the problem was. One day I'm home and alone. It's bad weather. Brenda's shopping or something. I don't know where she's going, but I'm home alone. So I take this little mechanical clock. And I didn't have a clock bench at that time. I used the table in our breakfast room. And I took the clock apart. I found the problem. 
So I corrected the problem. It had to do with the mainspring, and I got the mainspring corrected, and I started the process of putting the clock back together. There, I got it all together, and I started to put in the final screw, which you could barely even tell it was a screw, a small, small, small screw. And I began to place that screw in the clock, and somehow I dropped it. And it hit the table and bounced like a ping pong ball, and it bounced off of the table. There's a rug under that table. So I get on my hands and knees. I have my flashlight out and I'm looking and looking and looking. I'm under the table. I can't find that little old screw. I become non-spiritual. And all of a sudden, I hear the front door open. It's our youngest son, his wife, and their children, four children. And so I said, hello. And one of my grandsons says, Poppy, what are you doing under the table? <laughs> so I explained the situation to him. And I said, Braxton, I can't find this little screw. It's down in this carpet under the table. I, I can't find it. So he's down there with me, like we need more under the table. <laughs> so he's under the table with me, and finally he just says, what are we doing, Pop? I said, we're looking for this screw. He says, we'll never find the screw. That's what I needed to hear. He said, Poppy, you have that magnet out in the garage. Let's just, it pays to have brains. <laughs> so he goes out in the garage. He gets this, this little magnet, pretty strong, and he begins to run it over the carpet, and then he'd look at it, and then he'd look at it. Pretty soon he said, is that it? I said, Yes. I took the screw, this time I got it in the clock, and the clock worked. A family unit is many gears, springs, screws, intricate detail under God's plan. It will not work if just a screw is missing. What's missing in your home? What's missing in your family? Listen to me, dear people. You are a target. Two deer standing and talking on the edge of the woods one day And one deer has a huge target on his side. The other deer is talking and he says, Bummer of a birth bark, Frank. <laughs> the day that you got married and dedicated your relationship and that marriage to Jesus Christ, right. there was a target put on your home. And the only way I will lose my home is for me to surrender. I have no white flags except unto God. Have you already waved it? Have you already given in? I have two stories to tell you tomorrow night. It's of what I've discussed tonight. God can put back together the most minute missing pieces down to a undetectable little screw.
but it's us doing it God's way. Father, thank you for our time. 